Section 12 of Four Months in a Sneak Box. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya. Four Months in a Sneak Box by Nathaniel H. Bishop. Chapter 11. From Cape San Blas to St. Mark's. A portage across Cape San Blas. The Cow Hunters. A visit to the lighthouse. Once more on the sea. Portage into St. Vincent's Sound. Apalachicola. St. George's Sound and Oklockney River. Arrival at St. Mark's. The Negro Postmaster. The Philanthropist and His Neighbors. A Continuous and Protected Waterway from the Mississippi to the Atlantic Coast. A portage now loomed in our horizon. The distance across the neck of land was one-third of a mile only, but the ascent of the hills of the Gulf Beach would prove a formidable task. I proposed to Saddles that he should return to the boats, while I hurried down to the beach to the point of the Cape to find a man to assist us with their transportation from the bay to the sea. While discussing the plan, a noise in the thicket caught my ear, and turning our eyes to the spot, we saw two men hurrying from their ambush into the forest. We at once started in pursuit of them. When overtaken, they looked confused and acknowledged that the presence of strangers was so unusual in that region that they had been watching our movements critically from the moment we landed until we discovered them. These men wore a rough garb of cow hunters, and the older of the two informed me that his home was in Apalachicola. He was looking after his cattle, which had a very long range, and had been camping with his assistant along St. Joseph's Sound for many days, being now en route to his home. Two ponies were tied to a tree in a thicket, while a bed of palmetto leaves and dried grass showed where the hunters had slept the previous night. These men assured us that the happiest life was that of the cow hunter, who could range the forest for miles upon his pony and sleep where he pleased. The idea was that the nearer one's instincts and mode of life approached to that of a cow, the happier the man. Only another version, after all, of living close to nature. One of these wood philosophers, taking his creed from the animals in which all his hopes centered, said we should be as simple in our habits as an ox, as gentle as a cow, and do no more injury to our fellow man than a yearling. He was certain there would be less sin in the world if men were turned into cattle and he was sure cattle were happier than men, and generally more useful. Upon learning our dilemma, the good-natured fellows set at once to work to help us. We cut two pine poles, and placing one boat across them, each man grasped the end of a pole, and thus, upon a species of litter, we lifted the burden from the ground and bore it slowly across the land to the sea. Returning to the bay, we transported the second boat in the same manner, and, making a third trip, carried away our provisions, blankets, etc. It was now evening, and viewing with satisfaction our little boats resting upon the beautiful beach, we thanked our friends heartily for their kindness. The owner of a thousand cattle gave us a warm invitation to visit his orange grove in Apalachicola and then retired with his man to the nest in the woods, while we slept in our boats, with porpoises and blackfish sounding their nasal calls all night in the sea, which beat upon the strand at our feet. In the morning the wind arose and sent the waves tumbling in upon the beach. After breakfast I walked to the extremity of the Cape, and dined with Mr. Robert Coleman, the principal lightkeeper. He was a most ingenious man and an expert in the use of tools. 
The United States Lighthouse Establishment selects its light keepers from the retired army of wounded soldiers. In all my voyages along our coast and on inland waters, I have found the good results of the perfect discipline exercise by the superintendents of this bureau. These keepers live along a coast of some thousands of miles in extent on the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and the Gulf of Mexico, many of them in isolated positions, but honesty, economy, and intelligence skill are everywhere apparent. And these men work like an army of veterans. I have intruded upon their privacy at all hours, but have never found one of them open to criticism. There is no shirking of the onerous duties of their position. Too much praise cannot be given to these light keepers in their lonely towers, or to the intelligent heads which direct and govern their important work. As I was leaving the lighthouse, a young woman approached me, and introducing herself as a visitor to the keeper's family, said she had a favor to ask. Would it be too much trouble for the stranger, after he reached New York, to inquire the price of a switch of human hair of just the shade of her own flaxen locks, and write her about it? Of course, such an appeal could not be disregarded, but I confess that as I gazed upon the boundless sea and along the uninhabited strand and into the unsettled forests, I wondered where the men or women were to be found to appreciate the imported New York switch. Would it not waste its sweetness on the desert air in the unoccupied wilderness? The boisterous weather kept us on the beach until Friday, when we launched our boats and rowed along the coast three miles to a point opposite a lagoon, which was separated from the sea by a narrow strip of land. While pulling along the beach, great blackfish, some of them weighing at least 1,000 pounds, came up out of the sea and divided into four companies. The first ranged itself upon our right, the second upon our left, the third, forming a school, proceeded in advance, while the fourth brought up the rear. Unlike the frisky porpoises, these big fellows convoyed us in the most dignified manner, heaving their dark, shining, scaleless bodies half out of the water as they surged along within a few feet of our boats. When we arrived at our point of disembarkation and turned shoreward to run through the surf, our strange companion seemed loath to leave us, but rolled about in the offing, making their peculiar nasal sounds and spouting, like whales, jets of spray into the air. A landing was accomplished without shipping much water, and we immediately hauled the boats across the beach, about three or four hundred feet, into a narrow lagoon, the west branch of St. Vincent's Sound. Indian Pass was two miles east of our portage. It is an inlet of the sea through which small vessels pass into St. Vincent's Sound en route for the town of Apalachicola. Heavy seas were, however, breaking upon its bar at that time, and it would have been a dangerous experiment to have entered it in our small boats. Emerging from the lagoon, the broad areas of St. Vincent's Sound and Apalachicola Bay met our gaze, while beyond them were spread the waters of St. George's Sound. Following the coast on our left, numerous reefs of large and very flat oysters continually obstructed our progress. We gathered a bushel with our hands in a very few minutes, but as the wind commenced to blow most spitefully and the heavy forests of palms on the low shore offered a pleasant shelter, we disembarked about sunset in a magnificent grove of palmetto trees, spending a pleasant evening in feasting upon the delicious bivalves, roasted and upon the half-shell. The tempest held us prisoners in this wild retreat for two days, and during that time, if we had been the possessor of a dog, we might have supped and dined upon venison and wild turkey. As it was, we were well content to subsist upon wild ducks and the fine oysters, with bread from fresh wheat flour, baked in our Dutch oven, or baked kettle, and coffee that never tastes elsewhere as it does in camp. 
At last the gale went down with the sun, and we rode in the evening thirteen miles up the bay to Apalachicola and went into camp under the sandy beach at the lower end of the town. While sleeping soundly in our boats, at an early hour the next morning, someone came gently tapping at my chamber door, or, in sea phrase, pounding upon my hatch. I soon discovered that my visitor was Captain Daniel Fry, United States Inspector of Steamboats. His pretty cottage, environed with beds of blooming flowers, was perched upon the sandy bluff above us. The captain, in a nautical way, claimed us as salvage, and we were soon enjoying his generous hospitality. In this isolated town, once a busy cotton shipping port, there was a population of about one thousand souls, among whom, conspicuous for his urbane manners and scientific ability, lived Dr. A. W. Chapman, the author of The Flora of the Southern United States. While at New Orleans, I had addressed a letter to the postmaster at St. Mark's, Florida, requesting him to forward my letters to Apalachicola, but the request had not been noticed. The mystery was, however, explained by Lieutenant N. of the Coast Survey schooner Silliman, who one day called upon me and said that when he stopped at St. Mark's for his mail, a few days previous to my arrival at Apalachicola, he saw about thirty letters addressed to me, lying loosely upon the desk of the Negro postmaster of that marshy settlement. My letter of instruction had been received, but the postmaster could not read. No notice had been taken of it. The Coast Survey officer had kindly gathered my letters in one parcel and had deposited them for safekeeping with the postmaster's white clerk. The responsible position of postmaster was filled by an ignorant colored man because his politics were those of the party then in power. Nor was this an exceptional case, many such appointments having been made, as an inevitable result of a peculiar enfranchisement in which there is no restriction and where license stands for liberty. While on my voyage of the paper canoe, I met in one county, in Georgia, through which flows the beautiful Altamaha, the colored county treasurer, who lived in a little backwoods settlement a few miles from Darien. He could neither read nor write, but his business was managed and the county funds handled by a white politician of the reconstructing element then in power, which was sapping the lifeblood of the South and bonding every state within its selfish grasp by dishonest legislative acts. The poor black man was simply a tool for the white charlatan, living in a miserable log cabin and receiving a very small share of the peculations of his white clerk. While all the enfranchised are educated, and not until then, will the great source of evil be removed from our politics which today endangers our future liberty of self-government. We are floating in a sea of unlimited and unlettered enfranchisement, vainly tugging at the helm of our ship of state, while masterminds stoop to cater to the prejudices of hundreds of thousands of voters who cannot read the names upon the ticket they deposit into the ballot box, the ballot box which is the guardian of the constitutional liberties of the Republic. We left the kind people of Apalachicola and crossed the bay to St. George's Sound with a cargo of delicacies, for Captain Fry had filled our lockers with various comforts for the inner man, while our friend, the cattle owner, whom we had met at Cape San Blas, and who had now returned to his home, stocked us with delicious oranges from his grove on the outskirts of the city. Four miles to the east of Cat Point, we saw the humble homes of Peter Sheepshead and Sam Papano, two fishermen, whose uniform success in catching their favorite species of fish had won for them their euphonious titles. We camped at night near the mouth of Crooked River, which enters the sound opposite Dog Island, having rowed twenty-four miles. If we continued along the sound after passing out of its eastern end, we would be upon the open sea and might have difficulty in doubling the Great South Cape. 
So we took the interior route ascending Crooked River through a low pine savanna country to the Oclockney River, which is, in fact, a continuation of Crooked River. The region about Crooked and Oclockney Rivers is destitute of the habitation of man. About midday between St. George's Sound and the Gulf Coast, we traversed a vast swamp where the ground was carpeted with dwarf swall palmettos. A fire had killed all the large trees, and their blasted leafless forms were covered with the flaunting tresses of Spanish moss. The tops of many of these trees were crowned by the osprey's nest, and the birds were sitting on their eggs or feeding their young with fish, which they carried in their talons from the sea. So numerous were the fish hawks that we named the blasted swamp the home of the osprey. We spent one night in this swamp serenaded by the deep calls of the male alligators, which closely resembled the low bellowing of a bull. About noon the next day, signs of cultivated life appeared, and we passed the houses of some settlers and the sawmill of a New Yorker. At dusk, our boats entered a little sound, and by nine o'clock in the evening we arrived at the Gulf of Mexico in a region of shoal water, much cut up by oyster reefs. The tide being very low, the boats were anchored inside of an oyster reef, which afforded protection from the inflowing swell of the sea. We shaped our course next day for St. Mark's along a low, marshy coast where oyster reefs and shoal water frequently barred our progress. From South Cape to St. Mark's, the coast, broken by the mouths of several creeks and rivers, trends to the northeast, while for twenty miles to the east of the lighthouse, which rises conspicuously on the eastern shore of the entrance to St. Mark's River, the coast bends to the southeast to the latitude of Cedar Keys, where it turns abruptly south and forms one side of the peninsula of Florida. The great contour of the Gulf of Mexico, into which St. Mark's River empties, is known to geographies as Appalachie Bay. On that part of the coast between St. Mark's and Suwannee Rivers, the bed of the Gulf of Mexico slopes so gradually that when seven miles away from the land, a vessel will be in only 18 feet of water. At this distance from the shore is found the continuous coral formation, but nearer to the coast it is found in spots only. While traversing this coast from St. Mark's to Cedar Keys, I observed the peculiar features of a long coastline of salt marshes against which the waves broke gently. With the exception of a few places where the upland penetrated these savannas to the waters of the sea, the marshes were soft alluvium, covered with tall, coarse grasses, the sameness of which was occasionally broken by a hammock or low mound of firmer soil, which rose like an island out of the level sea of green. The hammocks were heavily wooded with the evergreen live oaks, the yellow pine, and the palmetto. From half a mile to two miles back of the low savannas of the coast rose, like a wall of green, the old forests, grand and solemn in their primeval character. The marshes were much cut up by creeks, some of which came from the mainland, but most of them had their sources in the savannas and served as drains to the territory, which was frequently submerged by the sea. When the southerly winds send towards the land a boisterous sea, the long, natural, inclined plain of the gulf bottom seems to act as a pacifier to the waves, for they break down as they roll over the continually shoaling area in approaching the marshes, and there is no undertow or any of the peculiar features which make the surf on other parts of the coast very dangerous in rough weather. The submarine grass growing upon the sandy bottom as far as six or eight miles from shore also helps to smooth down the waves. When the strong wind blows off the coast on the gulf, it is known to seamen as a norther, and so violent are these winds that their force acting on the sea rapidly diminishes its depth within twelve or fifteen miles of the marshes. 
A coasting vessel drawing five feet of water will anchor off Appalachee Bay in eight feet of water at the commencement of a norther, and in four or five hours, unless the crew put to sea, the vessel would be left upon the dry bottom of the gulf. After the wind falls, the water will return, and the equilibrium will be restored. We ascended the St. Mark's River, and passed the site of a town which had been washed out of existence in the year 1843 by the effects of a hurricane on the sea. These hurricanes are in season during August and September. The village of St. Mark's consisted of about 30 houses, the occupants of which, with two or three exceptions, were Negroes. The land is very low, and at times subjected to inundation. A railroad terminated here, but the business of the place supported only two trains a week, and they ran directly to the capital of Florida, the beautiful city of Tallahassee, 18 miles distant. The Negro postmaster courteously presented me with my package of letters, and I had an opportunity to observe the way in which he fulfilled his duties. When the mail arrived, it was thrown upon a desk in one corner of a small grocery store, and any person desiring an epistle went in, and, fumbling over the letters, took what he claimed as his own. The railroad agent, a young northerner, I found sleeping soundly in his telegraph office, though the noonday sun was pouring in his windows. He apologized for being caught napping, but declared it was his only amusement in that desolate region of damps and assured me a man would deteriorate less rapidly by sleeping away his idle hours than by keeping awake to what was going on in the neighboring hamlet. Besides the United States signal officer, his only intelligent neighbor was a brother of the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who had purchased a property, two or three years before, in the once flourishing town of Newport, a few miles up the river. He spoke feelingly of the efforts of the Reverend Charles Beecher to educate his enfranchised Negro neighbors, of his inviting them to his house and laboring for the welfare of their souls. All the patient and Christian efforts of the philanthropist had proved unavailing, and thieving and lying were still much in vogue. It has been proposed by engineers to connect all the interior Gulf Coast watercourses from the Mississippi River at New Orleans to the Suwannee River in Florida. To achieve this end, it will be necessary to evacuate several canals at points now used as portages. From St. Mark's to the Suwannee River, there are some rivers which might be used in connecting and perfecting this great interior waterway. I mentioned in my Voyage of the Paper Canoe that preliminary surveys under General Gilmore had been made for a continuous waterway across northern Florida to the Atlantic coast via the Suwannee and St. Mary's rivers. Detailed surveys are now in progress. Those interested in this enterprise hope to see the produce of the Mississippi Valley towed in barges through this continuous waterway from New Orleans to the Atlantic ports of St. Mary's, Fernandina, Savannah, and Charleston. The northwestern as well as the southern states would derive advantage from this extension of the Mississippi system to the Atlantic seaboard, and its execution seems to be considered by many a duty of the national government. There has been little written upon the watercourses of northwestern Florida, but several of the central, southern, and Atlantic coast rivers and lakes have been carefully explored by Mr. Frederick A. Ober of Massachusetts, a young and enthusiastic naturalist who, as correspondent of the forest and stream, has published in the columns of that paper a mass of interesting and valuable geographic matter, throwing much light on regions heretofore unfamiliar to the public. End of section 12. Section 13 of Four Months in a Sneak Box. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Freya. Four Months in a Sneak Box by Nathaniel H. Bishop. Chapter 12 From St. Mark's to the Suwannee River. Along the coast, saddles breaks down. A refuge with the fishermen. Camp in the palm forest. Parting with saddles. Our neighbor the alligator. Discovery of the true crocodile in America. The devil's woodpile. Dead man's bay. Bowlegs point. The coast survey camp. A day aboard the ready. The Swanee River. The End Leaving St. Mark's, we rode down the stream to the forks of the St. Mark's and Wakula Rivers. The sources of the Wakula were twelve miles above these forks, and consisted of a wonderful spring of crystal water, which could be entered by small boats. This curious river burst forth as though by a single bound, from the subterranean caverns of limestone. Each of the several remarkable springs in Florida is supposed, by those living in its vicinity, to be the veritable fountain of youth, and this one shared the usual fate. For we were assured that this was the spring for which the cavalier Ponce de Leon vainly sought in the old times of Spanish exploration in the New World. On Monday, March 13th, we left St. Mark's River, and, as the north wind blew, were forced to keep from one to two miles off the land, on the open gulf, to find even two feet of water. In many places we found rough pieces of coral rocks upon the bottom, and in several instances grounded upon them. As the wind went down, the tide, which on this coast frequently rises only from eighteen inches to two feet, favored us with more water and by night we were able to get close to the marshes and enter a little creek west of the Asilla River, where, staking our boats alongside the soft marsh, we supped on chocolate and dry bread and slept comfortably in our little craft until morning. We were now in an almost uninhabited region, where only an occasional fisherman or sponger is met, but as we moved along the coast the day after our camp in the marshes, we were struck with the absence of any sign of the presence of man. We had hoped to meet with the vessels of sponge-gatherers anchored in the vicinity of Rock Island, to which place they resort to clean their crop. But when we passed the island in the afternoon, so scantily clothed with herbage, and upon which a few palms grew out of the shallow soil, it was deserted, while not a single sail could be seen upon the horizon of the sea. My companion had not been well for several days, and he informed me at this late date that he was subject to malarial fever, or, as he called it, swamp fever. It had been contracted by him while living on one of the bayous of southern Louisiana during a warm season. Swamp fever, when at its height, usually produces temporary insanity— and he alarmed me by stating that he had been deprived of his reason for days at a time during his attacks. The use of daily stimulants had kept up his constitutional vigor for several months, but as ours was a temperance diet, he gradually, after we left Biloxi and the regions where stimulants could be obtained, became nervous, lost his appetite, and was now suffering from chills and fever. He was much depressed after leaving St. Mark's, and had long fits of sullenness, so that he would row for hours without speaking. I tried to cheer him, and on one occasion penetrated the forest a long distance to obtain some panacea with which to brace his unsettled nerves. Saddles had deceived me as to the necessity of taking daily drams, which habit is, to say the least, a most inconvenient one for persons engaged in explorations of isolated parts of the coast and voyaging in small boats. 
so we had both suffered much in consequence of his bad habit. To furnish one moderate drinker with the liquid stimulant necessary for a boat voyage from New Orleans to Cedar Keys, at least five gallons of whiskey and a large and heavy demijohn in which to store it securely must form a portion of the cargo. This bulk occupies important space in the confined quarters of a boat, every inch of which is needed for necessary articles. While the momentary and artificial strength given to the system is never, except as a remediable agent, productive of any real or lasting benefit. My unfortunate companion had become so accustomed to the daily use of liquor, and his shattered system had been so propped by it, that he had been like a man walking on stilts. And now that they were knocked away, his own feet failed to support him, and a reaction was the inevitable result. After leaving Rock Island and went about four miles beyond the Fenholloway River, while off a vast track of marshes, poor Saddles broke down completely. He could not row another stroke. I towed his boat into a little cove and was forced to leave him, with the fever raging in his blood, that I might search for a creek and a hammock upon which to camp. Looking to the east, I saw a long, low point of marsh projecting its attenuated point southward, while upon it rose a signal staff of the United States Coast Survey. A black object seemed heaped against the base of the signal, and while I gazed at what looked like a bear or a heap of dark soil, it began to move, breaking up into three or four fragments, of which seemed to roll off into the grass where they disappeared. I pulled for the point as rapidly as possible, for I hoped, while hardly daring to believe, that this singular apparition might be human beings. The high grass formed an impenetrable barrier for my curious vision, but nearing the point, voices were plainly audible on the other side of the narrow point, as though a party of men were in lively discussion. Rowing close to the land and resting on my oars to gain time to reconnoiter either friends or foes, the deep but cultivated voice of a man fell upon my ear. A patriot was evidently haranguing his fellow fishermen, who, after lunching beside the coast survey signal and not observing the proximity of a stranger, had repaired to their boats on the east side of the marsh. Yes, came the tones of the orator through the high grass. Yes, to this state have we Americans been reduced. Not satisfied with having ravaged our country, conquering but not subduing our Confederate government, the enemy has put over us a carpet-bag government of northern adventurers and southern scallywags and niggers. Fifty niggers sit as representatives of our state in the legislature of Florida and vote in a solid body for whichever party pays them their price. They are giving away our state lands to monopolists, and we have tax bills like this one imposed upon us. Here the orator paused, apparently taking a paper from his pocket. Here it is, he resumed, in black and white, on a wild piece of forest land and a few acres of clearing, which they appraise at twenty-five cents, when it cost me only six cents and a quarter per acre, I was saddled with this outrageous bill. I will read to you the several items. Mr. L. H. D. R. To state taxes proper, seventy cents on one hundred dollars. General sinking fund, thirty cents on one hundred dollars. Special sinking fund, sixteen cents on one hundred dollars. General school tax, ten cents on one hundred dollars. Total state tax, one dollar twenty-six cents on one hundred dollars. To county tax proper, fifty cents per one hundred dollars. County school tax, fifty cents on one hundred dollars. Special county building tax, thirty-five cents on one hundred dollars. County specific tax, two dollars on one hundred dollars. 
total county tax $3.35 on $100. Total state and county tax $4.61 on $100. You will find by these figures that I am compelled to pay a state and county tax on an over-appraised property, amounting to $4.61 upon every $100 I possess. Under this kind of taxation, we are growing poorer every day of our lives. Now, gentlemen, can you censure me for detesting the carpetbag government of my native state after you have heard this statement? Rome in days of tyranny did no such injustice to her citizens. To be a Roman was greater than to be a king. And here, let me remark, Bob Squash, what's that you're squinting at through the grass? Lord's sakes, Massa Hampen, I does believe it's a man in a sort of a boat. I never see the like before. At this point, the company struggled through the high grass and invited me to land. Being seriously alarmed for my companion, who was lying helpless in his boat half a mile away, I quickly explained my situation and was at once advised to ascend Spring Creek on the east side of the Point of Marsh to the swamp where the orator said I would find his camp and his partner in the fishing business, who would assist me to the best of his ability. The orator promised to follow us after making one more cast with his seine for redfish. I returned as fast as possible to Saddles, and trying to infuse his failing heart with courage, fastened his boat's painter to the stern of the duck boat and followed the course indicated by the fisherman. Upon entering Spring Creek with my companion in tow, we were soon encompassed on all sides by the marshes, and as the boat slowly ascended the crooked stream, the fringes of the feathery crested palms appeared close to the margins of the savanna. The land increased in height a few inches as I followed the reaches of the creek, and when a mile from its mouth entered the rank luxuriance of a swamp where, in a thicket of red cedars, palmettos, and Spanish bayonets, I discovered two low huts, thatched with palm leaves, which afforded temporary shelter to Captain F., a planter from the interior, his friend the orator, and their employees, both white and black. The kind-hearted captain understood my companion's case at a glance, and when our tent was pitched and a comfortable bed prepared, Saddles was put under his care. He could not have fallen into better hands, for the planter had gone through many experiences in the treatment of fevers of all kinds. It was indeed a boon to find in the unpeopled wilds a shelter and a physician for the sick man, but the future loomed heavily before me, for though Saddles might improve, he would be pretty sure on the eighth day to have a return of his malady and would probably again break down in a raving condition. The camp was a restful and interesting retreat. To reach the spot, the fishing party had been obliged to cut a road eight miles through a swampy district, in places building a rough crossway to make their progress possible. The creek had its sources in several springs, which burst from the earth just above the camp. The water was of a blue tint, and slightly impregnated with sulfur, lime, and iron. In this secluded place, there was an abundance of deer and wild turkeys. The early morning meal of these hunters and fishermen was a veritable de joiner a la fourchette, for the menu included venison, turkey, sweet potatoes, hoe cakes made from fresh maize flour, and excellent coffee. Captain F. and an old Negro woman remained in camp to clean and salt down the fish caught on the previous afternoon, while the orator and his party went down to the creek in two long, narrow scows, loaded with two nets, their necessary fishing implements, and a hearty luncheon. Long poles were used to propel their craft. Upon meeting with a school of fish, they encompassed it with the two nets, each of which was three hundred feet long, and easily captured the whole lot, which was composed of several species. When in luck, the fishing party returned to the camp by noon. 
But when the wind interfered with their success, they did not reach their swampy retreat until night. After a rest and a good warm supper, the orator and one of his white associates, each with his torch of resinous pine wood and well-loaded gun, would quietly traverse the silent forests and grassy savannas, luring to destruction the fascinated and unsuspecting deer. Thus stalking through the darkness and peering eagerly on all sides, the appearance of the fire-like globes of the deer's eyes from the reflected light of the hunter's torches was the signal to fire, which meant, with their unerring aim, death to their prey and future feasts for themselves. With their venison these men served a very palatable dish made from the terminal bud of the palmetto known as the cabbage, and from which the tree derives its name of cabbage palm. A negro ascended the palm and cut the bud at its junction with the top of the tree. It was then thrown to the ground, and climbing other trees, more followed in quick succession. When a sufficient quantity had been gathered, the turnip part, from which the tender shoot starts, was cut off and thrown aside, as it was bitter to the taste. The shoot, divested of this part, resembled a solid roll, from four to six inches in diameter. From this was unrolled and thrown aside the outer coverings, leaving the tender white interior tissues about three inches in diameter and fourteen inches in length. Thus divested of all objectionable matter, the cabbage could be eaten raw, though it was much improved by cooking, the boiling process removing every trace of the acrid or turnip flavor. These men ate it dressed in the same way as ordinary cabbage, and it was an excellent substitute for that dish. The black bear is as fond of the palmetto cabbage as his enemy, the hunter. He ascends the tree, breaks down the palm leaves, and devours the bud, evidently appreciating the feast. After the removal of the bud, the tree dies, so this is, after all, an expensive dainty. Captain F. had preempted a tract of 160 acres of land to cover the sources of Spring Creek, and it was his intention to resort to this camp every year during the mullet fishing season, which is from September to January. The salted mullet is the popular market fish with the backcountry people, though the redfish is by far the finer for table use. While with these men, we were treated with the generous hospitality known only in the forest, but saddles did not improve. He seemed to be suffering from a low form of intermittent fever and looked like anything but a subject for a long row. Captain F. insisted upon sending the invalid in his wagon 16 miles to his home, where he promised to nurse the unfortunate man until he was able to travel 40 miles further to a railroad station. On the 15th of March, the party, having made their final arrangements, were ready to make the start for home. It was our last day together. Circumstances over which I had no control forced me to part from saddles. I furnished him with a liberal supply of funds to enable him to reach Fernandina, Florida, by rail, and afterwards sent him a draft for an amount sufficient to pay his expenses from Cedar Keys to New Orleans, as he abandoned all his previous intentions of returning to his old home in the north. The riddle with its outfit and about sixty pounds of shot and a large supply of powder I presented to the good captain, who had so generously offered to care for my unfortunate companion. As I was to traverse the most desolate part of the coast between Spring Lake and Cedar Key alone, I deemed it prudent to divest myself of everything that could be spared from my boat's outfit in order to lighten the hull. I had made an estimate of chances and concluded that four or five days would carry me to the end of my voyage, if the weather continued favorable. So on the evening of March 15, the little duck boat was prepared for future duty. The hunters and fishermen brought into camp the spoils of the forest and the treasures of the sea, while the grinning negress exerted herself to prepare the parting feast. 
deep in the recesses of the wild swamp, our campfire crackled and blazed, sending up its flaming tongues until they almost met the dense foliage above our heads. While seated upon the ground, we feasted and told tales of the past. Poor Saddles tried to be cheerful, but made a miserable failure of it, and his pale face was the skeleton at our banquet, for human nature is so constituted that a suffering man gains sympathy, even though he be only paying the penalty of his own misdemeanors. My boat was tied alongside the bank of the creek, close to the palmetto huts. There were only two feet of water in the stream as I sat in the little sneak box at midnight and went through the usual preparations for stowing myself away for the night. I touched the clear water with my hands as it laved the sides of my floating home, but my gaze could not penetrate the limpid current, for the heavy shades of the palms gave it a dark hue. I thought of the duties of the morrow, and also of poor saddles, who was tossing uneasily upon the blankets in his tent nearby, when there was a mysterious movement in the water under the boat. Something unusual was there, for its presence was betrayed by the large bubbles of air which came up from the bottom and floated upon the surface of the water. Being too sleepy to make an investigation, I coiled myself in my nest and drew the hatch cover over the hold. The next morning my friends clustered on the bank, giving me a kind farewell as I pushed the duck boat gently into the channel of the creek. Suddenly Saddles, who had been gazing abstractly into the water under my boat, hurried into the tent, and in an instant reappeared with the gun I had given him in his hands. He slowly pointed it at the spot in the water where my boat had been moored during the night, and drawing the trigger, an explosion followed while the water flew upward in fine jets into the air. Then, to the astonished gaze of the party on the bank, an alligator as long as my boat arose to view and, roused by the shock, hurried into deeper water. It was now evident what the lodger under my boat had been, and I confess the thought of being separated from this fierce saurian by only a half an inch of cedar sheathing during a long night was not a pleasant one, and I shuddered while my imagination pictured the consequences of a nocturnal bath in which I might have indulged. Having observed in different countries the habits of some of the individuals which compose the order Soria, the lizards, I will present to the reader what I have gleaned from my observation upon two species, one of which is the true alligator, A. mississippiensis, the other, the well-known true crocodile, C. acutus, which recently has been declared an inhabitant of the United States. It is only a few years since it was found living on the North American continent, for previous to its discovery in southern Florida, its nearest known habitat to the United States was the island of Cuba. The order of lizards is separated into families, the family to which the alligators, crocodiles, and gavials belong is called the naturalist crocodilo. The distinctions which govern the separation of the family crocodilo into three genera of alligators, crocodiles, and gavials consist of peculiarities in the shape of the head, in the particular arrangement of the teeth, webbing of the feet, and in some minor characteristics— for outside of these not very important anatomical differences, the habits of the three kinds of reptiles are in most respects quite similar, some of the species being more ferocious and consequently more dangerous than others. The alligator, also called caiman by the Spanish-American Creoles, inhabits the rivers and bayous of the North and South American continents, while the crocodiles are natives of Africa of the West Indies, and of South America. The fierce gavial genus is Asian and abounds in the rivers of India. The alligator, A. mississippiensis, and the crocodile, C. acutus, are the only species which particularly interest the people of the United States, for they both belong to our own fauna.
Our alligator inhabits the rivers and swampy districts of the southern states. I have never heard of their being found north of the Nuis River, though they probably ascend in small numbers some of the numerous rivers and creeks of the northern side of Albemarle Sound in North Carolina. The bayous and swamps of Louisiana and the low districts of Florida are particularly infested with these animals. The frequent visits of man to their haunts makes them timid of his presence, but where he is rarely or never seen, the larger alligators become more dangerous. During warm, sunny days, this reptile delights in basking in the sunlight upon the bark of a stream for hours at a time. At the approach of man, he crawls or slides from his slimy bed into the water, but if his retreat be cut off or he become excited, a powerful odor of musk exudes from his body. During the winter months, he hibernates in the mud of the bayous for days and weeks at a time. When the alligator enters the water, a pair of lips or valves close tightly, hermetically sealing his ears so that even moisture cannot penetrate them. His nostrils are protected in the same way. As the season for incubation approaches, the female searches for a sandy spot and digging a hole with her forefeet, deposits there her eggs, which are somewhat smaller than those of a goose. They are usually placed in layers, carefully covered up in the sand, and if not disturbed by wild animals, are hatched by the heat of the sun. It frequently happens that the alligator cannot find a sandbank in which to place her eggs, and on such occasions she scrapes together with her forefeet grass, leaves, bark and sticks mixed with mud and converting the hole into a low platform deposits the eggs upon it in separate layers, each layer being sandwiched with the mixture of mud, sticks, etc., until more than 100 white eggs of a faint green tint are carefully stowed away in the nest. The exterior of the nest, which has a mound-like character, is daubed over with mud the tail of the alligator being used as a trowel. The first duties of maternity being over, the female alligator acts as policeman until the eggs are hatched. Her office is not a sinecure for the fowls of the air, and the creeping things upon earth are attracted to the entombed delicacies secreted in this oven-like structure in the swamp. Many a luckless coon and cracker's pig searching for a breakfast receive instead a blow from the strong tail of the female alligator and are swept into the grasp of her terrible and relentless jaws. Moisture and heat act their parts in assisting the process of incubation, and the little alligators, a few inches in length, issue from the shell and are welcomed by their male-clad mother into the new world. Like young turtles just from the shell, the baby alligators make for the water, but unlike the young of the sea turtles, the Saurians have the assistance of their parent, who not unfrequently takes a load of them upon her back. From the first inception of nest building until the young are able to take care of themselves, this reptile mother, like the female wild turkey, resists the encroachments of her mate who would devour not only the eggs, but his own crawling children. In fact, if opportunity were offered by the absence of the mother from the rest and the young, his alligatorship would eat up all his progeny and exterminate his species without a particle of regret. He has no pride in the perpetuation of his family, and it is to the maternal instincts of his good wife that we owe the preservation of the alligator. The young avoid the larger males until they are strong enough to protect themselves feeding in the meantime upon fish and flesh of every description. In the water they move with agility, but on land their long bodies and short legs prevent rapid motion. They migrate during droughts from one slough or bayou to another, crossing the intervening upland. When discovered on these journeys by man, the alligator feigns death, or at least appears to be in an unconscious state. But if an antagonist approach within reach of that terrible tail, 
A blow, a sweep, and a snapping together of the jaws prove conclusively his dangerous character. He is a good fisherman and can also catch ducks, drawing them by their feet underwater. The dog is, however, the favorite diet of these saurians, and the Negroes make use of a crying puppy to allure the creature from the bottom of a shoal bayou within reach of their guns. Though clad in a coat of thick, bony scales, a well-directed charge of buckshot from a gun or a lead ball from a musket will penetrate the body, notwithstanding all that has been said to the contrary. The Negroes in the Gulf States say that de Gator swallows a pine knot before de goes into de mud burrows for de winter, and the fact that pine knots and pieces of wood are found in the stomachs of these animals at all seasons of the year gives a shade of truth to this statement. Even the hardest substances, such as stones and broken bottles, are taken in considerable quantities from the bodies of dead alligators. Their digestive organs are certainly not sensitive, their nervous systems not delicate, and their intelligence not remarkable. It gives an alligator but little inconvenience to shoot off a portion of its head, with a mass of the brain attached to it, and they have been known to fight for hours with the entire brain removed. Though generally fleeing from man upon terra firma, the alligator will quickly attack him in the water. A friend of mine, mounted upon his horse, was crossing a Florida river in the wilderness. When entering the channel of the stream, the horse's feet did not touch the bottom, and he swam for a moment or two, struggling with the current. My friend suddenly felt a severe grip on his leg and the pressure of sharp teeth through his trousers when realizing in a flash that an alligator's jaws were fastened upon him. He clasped the neck of his horse with all his strength. For a few seconds he was in danger of being dragged from the back of his faithful animal, but his dog, following in the rear, gained quickly on the struggling horse, and the alligator, true to his well-known taste, loosed his hold upon the man, and catching the dog in his strong jaws, dragged the poor brute to the bottom of the river." The alligator is fast disappearing from our principal southern rivers and is also being captured in considerable numbers in isolated bayous by hunters who kill the creature for his hide, as the alligator boots have a durability not possessed by any other leather. There is much interest connected with the discovery of the existence of the true crocodile, C. acutus, in the Floridian Peninsula. While the alligators have broader heads, shorter snouts, and more numerous teeth than the crocodiles, the unscientific hunter can at once identify the true crocodile, C. acutus, by two holes in the upper jaw, into which and through which the two principal teeth, or tushes, of the lower jaw protrude, and can be seen by looking down upon the head of the animal. The longest teeth of the alligator do not thus protrude through the head or snout, but fit into sockets in the upper jaw. I first studied the true crocodile in the island of Cuba, where there are two distinct species of the genus, one of which is our Florida species, C. acutus. At that time, science was blind to the fact that the true crocodile was a member of the fauna of the United States. At a meeting of the Boston Society of Natural History, held May 19, 1869, the late comparative anatomist Dr. Jeffries Wyman exhibited the head of a crocodile, C. acutus, which had been sent him by William H. Hunt, Esquire, of Miami River, which stream flows out of the Everglades and empties into Key Biscayne Bay at the southeastern end of the Floridian Peninsula. A second cranium of the sharp-nosed crocodile was afterwards obtained from the same locality, but the honor of killing and recognizing one of these huge monsters belongs to the young and enterprising author of The Birds of Florida, a work full of original information, the illustrations of which, as well as the setting up of the type, being the work of the author's own hands. I refer to Mr. C.J. Maynard, of Newtonville, Massachusetts, 
who has furnished me with a graphic description of his meeting with and the capture of the crocodile while engaged in his ornithological pursuits during the year 1867. Mr. Maynard says, This crocodile is particularly noticeable for its fierceness. I have met with it but once. Three of us were crossing the country, which lies between Lake Harney and Indian River, on foot, when we came to a dense swamp. As we were passing through it, we discovered a huge reptile, which resembled an alligator, lying in a stream just to the right of our path. He was apparently asleep. We approached cautiously within ten rods of him and fired two rifle shots in quick succession. The balls took effect in front of his foreleg and, striking within two inches of each other, passed entirely through his body. As soon as he felt the wounds, he struggled violently, twisting and writhing, but finally became quiet. We waded in and approached him as he lay upon a bed of green aquatic plants with his head towards us. It was resting on the mud, and one of the party was about to place his foot upon it when a lively look in the animal's eyes deterred him. Stooping down, he picked up a floating branch and lightly threw it in the reptile's face. The result was somewhat surprising. The huge jaws opened instantly, and the formidable tail came around, sweeping the branch into his mouth, where it was crushed and ground to atoms by the rows of sharp teeth. His eyes flashed fire, and he rapidly glided forward. Never did a magician of Arabian tales conjure a fiercer-looking demon by wave of his hand than had been raised to life by the motion of a branch. For a moment we were too astonished to move. The huge monster seemed bent on revenge, and in another instant would be upon us. We then saw our danger, and quicker than a flash of light, thought and action came. The next moment the gigantic Saurian was made to struggle on his back with a bullet in his brain. It had entered his right eye, and had been aimed so nicely as not to cut the lids. To make sure of him this time, we severed his jugular vein. While performing this not very delicate operation, he thrust out two singular-looking glands from slits in his throat. They were round, resembling a sea urchin, being covered with minute projections, and were about the size of a nutmeg, giving out a strong, musky odor. We then took his dimensions and found he was over ten feet in length, while his body was larger round than a flour barrel. The immense jaws were three feet long, and when stretched open would readily take in the body of a man. They were armed with rows of sharp white teeth, the tusks of the lower one, when it was closed, projected out through two holes in the upper, which fact proved to us that it was not a common alligator, but a true crocodile. See Acutus. If Mr. Maynard had been at that time aware of the value of the prize he had captured, the market price of which was some four or five hundred dollars, he would not have abandoned his crocodile. He afterwards sent for its head, but could not obtain it. This reptile will probably be found more numerous about the headwaters of the Miami River than further north. It sometimes attains a length of seventeen feet. Since Mr. Maynard shot his crocodile, others from the north have searched for the sea acutus, and one naturalist from Rochester, New York, captured a specimen and attempted to make a new species of it by giving it the specific name of Floridanus in place of the older one of C. acutus. The morning sun was shining brightly as I pulled steadily along the coast, passing Warrior Creek six miles from my starting point off the shores of Spring Creek. About this locality the rocky bottom was exchanged for one of sand. Having rowed eleven miles, a small sandy island, one-third of a mile from shore, offered a resting place at noon, and there I dined upon bread and cold canned beef. A mile further to the eastward, a sandy point of the marsh extended into the gulf. A dozen oaks, two palmentos, and a shanty in ruins upon this bleak territory were the distinctive features which marked it as Jug Island though the firm ground is only an island rising out of the marshes. 
Sandy points jutting from the lowlands became more numerous as I progressed on my route. Four miles from Jug Island, the wide debauchure of Blue Creek came into view, with an unoccupied fishing shanty on each side of its mouth. Crossing at dusk to the east shore of the creek, I landed in shoal water on a sandy strand when the wind arose to a tempest, driving the water on to the land, and had it not been for my watch tackle, the little duck boat must have sought other quarters. As it was, she was soon high and dry on a beach, and once beneath her sheltering hatch, I slept soundly, regardless of the screeching winds and dashing seas around me. Before the sun had gilded the waters the next morning, the wind subsided, my breakfast was cooked and eaten, and the boat's prow pointed towards the desolate, almost uninhabited wilderness of Dead Man's Bay. The low tide annoyed me somewhat, but when the wind arose it was fair and assisted all day in my progress. The marine grasses upon which the turtles feed covered the bottom, and many curious forms were moving about it in the clear water. Six miles from Blue Creek I found a low grassy island of several acres in extent, and while in its vicinity frequently grounded, but as the water was shoal, it was an easy matter to jump overboard and push the lightened boat over the reefs. About noon the wind freshened and forced me nearer to the shore. As I crossed channel ways between shoals, the porpoises which were pursuing their prey frequently got aground and presented a curious appearance working their way over a submarine ridge by turning on their sides and squirming like eels. By two o'clock p.m., the wind forced me into the bite of Dead Man's Bay. The gusts were so furious that prudence demanded a camp, and it was eagerly sought for in the region of ominous name and gloomy associations. I had been told that there was but one living man in this bay, which is more than twenty miles wide. This settler lived two miles up the Steinhatchie River, which flows into the bite of Deadman's Bay. In a certain part of the wilderness of this region, a tract of savanna and pine lands approached near to the waters of the Gulf, and was known as the Devil's Woodpile. Superstition has made this much-dreaded forest the scene of wild and horrible tales, Fishermen had warned me of its dismal shades and of the wild cattle which roamed unheeded through its dreary recesses. Hunters, they said, had entered it in strong force, but the wild bulls were so fierce that the bravest were driven back and the dangerous task abandoned. Calves had been born in the fastnesses of the devil's woodpile and had grown old without being branded by their owners, who feared the sharp horns of the paternal bulls, the courageous defenders of their native pastures. Skirting the marshy savannas of his satanic majesty's earthly dominion, I ascended the Steinhatchie River, when a clearing with a rough house and store gave unmistakable signs of the proximity of the settler of whom I had heard. I was preparing to make my camp near the landing, when the proprietor made his appearance, courteously inviting me to his house, where he held me a willing prisoner for three days, giving me much information in regard to life in the woods. He had been a soldier in the Seminole War, and had passed through varied experiences, but had settled down, as he expressed it, to the Red Cedar business. Six long years had this man and his wife delved and toiled in the desolate region of Dead Man's Bay, seeing no one except a few cedar cutters from the interior who stocked up at his store before going into the wilderness. A great deal of red cedar is cut on the shores and in the back country of the Steinhatchie River. The squatters and small farmers called crackers engaged in this work are not hampered by the Eighth Commandment, and Uncle Sam has to suffer in consequence most of the timber being cut on United States government reserves. It finds its way to the cedar warehouses of merchants in the town of Cedar Keys. I have seen whole rafts of this valuable red cedar towed into Cedar Keys and sold there, when the parties purchasing knew it to be stolen from the government lands. 
My kind host, Mr. James H. Stevens, was the first honest purchaser of this government cedar I had met, for he cheerfully and promptly paid the requisite tax upon it and seemed to be endeavoring to protect the property of the government. From Mr. Stevens's hospital home, I proceeded along the gulf past Rocky Creek to Frog Island, a treeless bit of territory where a little shanty had been erected by the Coast Survey officers to shelter a tide-gauge watcher. The island was now deserted. The coast was indeed desolate, and it was a cheering sight in the middle of the afternoon to catch a glimpse of signs of the past presence of man on Pepperfish Key, an island a little distance from land rising out of the sparkling sea and crowned with a rough but picturesque shanty. Another reminder of the untiring efforts of our Coast Survey Bureau. A prominent point of land near this islet runs far into the gulf and is known as Bow Legs Point, supposed to be named after a chief of the Seminole Indians, whom I happened to meet many years before I saw the point, which had the honor of bearing his name. Our meeting was in the southern city, but I had the misfortune to appear on the wrong day and lost the honor of being received by that celebrity, as he had partaken too freely of the hospitality of his white friends and could only utter, Big Injun don't receive. Big Injun too much drunk. As night approached, I crossed a large bay and entered the very shoal water off Horseshoe Point close to Horseshoe and Bird Islands. These pretty islets were green with palmetto and other foliage, while upon the firm land of Horseshoe Point appeared. In the last rays of the setting sun, a white sandy strand crowned with a palmetto hut and a little white tent. Two finely modeled boats rested upon the beach, and five miles out to sea was pictured upon the horizon, like a phantom ship, the weird and indistinct outlines of the United States Coast Survey schooner. The tide was on the last of the ebb, and finding it impossible to get within half a mile of the point, I anchored my little craft, built a fire in my big kettle, made coffee on board, and quietly turning in for a doze, rested until the tide arose, when in the darkness I hauled my boat ashore and awaited the break of day. As soon after breakfast as wood etiquette admitted, I joined the party on the beach and was welcomed to their breakfast table under the shelter of their pretty white tent. Learning much to my satisfaction that I was an expected guest and my arrival had been looked for some days before, this party from the schooner Ready was engaged in establishing a baseline two miles in length at Horseshoe Point and was under the charge of Mr. F. Wally Perkins, who was assisted by Messrs. John DeWolf, R. E. Duval, and William S. Bond. The readers of my Voyage of the Paper Canoe may recognize in Mr. Bond, a member of this party, a gentleman whom I had met on board the Coast Survey vessel Caswell, in Bulls Bay, on the South Carolina coast the previous winter. Only those who have gone through similar experiences can imagine what I felt at being thus brought into contact with men of intelligence. It was as though a man had been pulling through a heavy fog, and suddenly the sun burst forth in all its glory. Nature is grand and restful, and green savannas and tranquil waters leave fair pictures in our memories, but after all, Man is eminently a social being and needs companions of his kind. My lonely voyage had been so monotonous that this return to the society of civilized man had a peculiar effect on my mind, it being in so receptive a state that the most minute incident was noted, and the tent with its surroundings, the breakfast table with its genial hosts, the very appearance of the water and the sky— were so indelibly impressed upon my memory that they never can be effaced. It is fortunate the picture is a pleasant one, as in fact were all the hours passed with the gentlemen of the schooner ready. On Saturday evening the party prepared to go on board the ready, and as I was to pass Sunday with them, 
it was deemed prudent to send my boat to a safe anchorage ground on the east side of Horseshoe Bay, where, moored among some islands, my floating home would be protected from boisterous seas and covetous fishermen. Climbing the sides of the Reddy, I was filled with admiration for the beautiful vessel, the last one built especially for the Coast Survey Service. The entire craft, with its clean decks and well-arranged interior, was a model of order and skillful arrangement. The home-like cabin, with its books and various souvenirs of the officers, was in strange contrast with the close quarters of my own little boat. The day was most pleasantly passed, and as the morrow threatened to be windy, Mr. Perkins kindly offered to put me on board the sneak box before sunset. The jig was manned by a stalwart crew of sailors, and the chief of the party took the tiller ropes in his hands as we dashed away through the waves toward Horseshoe Bay. At four in the afternoon we entered the sheltered waters of a miniature archipelago, close to the coast, and I beheld with a degree of affection and satisfaction, experienced only by a boatman, my own little craft floating safely at her moorings. The officers gave me a sailor's hearty farewell. The boat's crew bent to their oars and were soon far in the offing, growing each moment more indistinct while I gazed, until a white speck, like a gull resting upon the sea, was the only visible sign left me of Mr. Perkins and his party. My voyage of twenty-six hundred miles was nearly ended. The beautiful Suwanee River, from which I had emerged in my paper canoe one year before, when I had terminated a voyage of twenty-five hundred miles, begun in the high latitude of Canada, was only a few miles to the eastward. Upon reaching its debauchure on the Gulf Coast, the termini of the two voyages would be united. It would be only a few hours' pull from the mouth of the Swanee to the port of Cedar Keys, whose railroad facilities offered to the boat and her captain quick transportation across the peninsula of Florida to Ferdinandina on the Atlantic coast, where kind friends had prepared for my arrival. While I gazed upon the smooth sea, a longing to pass the night on the dark waters of the River of Song took possession of me, and mechanically weighing anchor, I took up my oars and pulled along the coast to my goal. Before sunset, the old landmark of the mouth of the Swanee, the iron boiler of a wrecked blockade runner, appeared above the shoal water, and I began to search for the little hammock called Bradford's Island, where one year before I had spent my last night on the Gulf of Mexico with the Maria Teresa, my little paper canoe. Soon it rose like a green spot in the desert, the well-remembered grove coming into view, with the half-dead oak's scraggy branches peering out of the feathery tops of the palmettos. Entering the swift current of the river, I gazed out upon the sea, which was bounded only by the distant horizon. The sun was slowly sinking into the green of the western wilderness. A huge saurian dragged his mail-clad body out of the water and settled quietly in his oozy bed. The sea glimmered in the long horizontal rays of light, which clothed it in a sheen of silver and of gold. The wild seagulls winnowed the air with their wings, as they settled in little flocks upon the smooth water, as though to enjoy the bath of soft sunlight that came from the west. The great forest behind the marshes grew dark as the sun slowly disappeared, while palm-crowned hammocks on the savannas stood out in bold relief like islets in the sea of green. The sun disappeared, and the soft air became heavy with the mists of night as I sank upon my hard bed with a feeling of gratitude to him, whose all-protecting arm had been with me in sunshine and in storm. Lying there under the tender sky, lighted with myriads of glittering stars, a soft gleam of light stretched like a golden band along the water until it was lost in the line of the horizon. Beyond it all was darkness. It seemed to be the path I had taken, the course of my faithful boat. 
back in the darkness were the ice cakes of the Ohio, the various dangers I had encountered. All I could see was the band of shining light, the bright end of the voyage. End of section 13. End of four months in a sneak box.